background. So uh, the Alabama Renaissance Fair and the University of North Alabama and the library have partnered for three years where uh, Dr. Bibby from the University of North Alabama History Department lines up speakers for our annual lecture series and these guys always bring their A games. I don't think any of them even have a B game. They always do great lectures. Of course, if you remember last year, we streamed them live last year because of COVID. This year, we were able to have people back in the library, but there are some people um, tuning in from, from home. Um, I'll have a few closing announcements just to remind you of stuff coming up later in the month. So, Lord William, please remind me not to forget to plug next week and some other stuff. But uh, without any further ado, uh, I will introduce Dr. Bibby, who, if you're local, he doesn't need any introduction. He's the dean of the University of North Alabama History <laughs> Department and a walking encyclopedia of everything you ever wanted to know about the tutors, but were afraid to ask. <laughs> Today, he's going to be doing a program entitled Paleography, uh, Reading Early Modern Documents, and it's uh, uh, audience participation, so you... Mm, if you want to grab some a pen and paper at home, maybe you can uh, follow along with us. So without uh, eating up any more of his time, Dr. Jeffrey Bibby. Thank you. I am going to take my mask off just so that yes, feel free. those that are live streaming can hear me well. Um, it's good to be back in person. Uh, and we have been transitioning back to more in-person activities at the university. And while last year was fun, and I do think we enjoyed the film series and uh, chatting, it was definitely a little different than what we uh, have traditionally been able to do as part of this lecture series. Uh, when we were thinking about this year's program, one of the things I was, I was kind of wrestling with was how have we been historians throughout the pandemic? And what we have been doing uh, as historians to remain active within the discipline, at many times when the archives and materials that we desperately need to continue our research have not been available to us. Uh, and so I wanted to just kind of think about a bit more of the historian's craft. And so, and this, this ties in with a project I've been working on that I'll talk about uh, after we kind of go through this uh, bit of an exercise. And that's just the concept of paleography. Uh, as historians, paleography is one of those key skills that we have to develop. And it is very simply just reading old text. Now, when we say old, that's literally anything arguably before the 20th century. So it's a very wide ranging uh, skill set that you have to develop. Uh, and in many cases, historians develop very specific skills based on the periods they study, the languages that they study, uh, the locations, and the types of um, materials that they use. There's, there's some wonderful niches within paleography. But what paleography helps us do, it helps us date documents, it helps us to understand the production of manuscripts and primary source material. And it also does allow us, uh, as historians, to develop some very specific skill sets, uh, something that the humanities is not always known for. Now, try to take a moment and read this passage. The human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole order of the letters in the word can be in a total mess, but you can still read it without any problem. <coughs> I don't know if you're on the live stream, you can read this, but the letters are all jumbled up. Now, it's important to understand that our minds are always reading for comprehension. That's what we were taught to do as little children. Uh, and while we may have had instructors that drilled in us grammar, spelling, and punctuation and made us correct, and I remember in seventh grade diagramming sentences, and I think that's all we did in seventh grade in eight months. <laughs> the goal really is to try to understand the passage that we're reading. Now, because this is our, our brain's way of processing information, it actually works against us when we're trying to think about paleography as a skill set. Because when we're working with older documents, <coughs> our ability to read it is, is compromised by several things. It might be the quality of the paper that the document's written on. Keeping in mind that modern paper, uh, pulp paper, is uh, very difficult to see through. You can hold it up to the light. There's not much that I can see through that. But older papers are much thinner. Uh, so often there's bleed. Uh, you might, if you write on the reverse side of the paper, it will bleed through to the other side. Uh, think about writing with ink. 
or, or even other materials. Uh, think about the use of a quill or stylus. Uh, it's very difficult every time you pick it up it leaves a drop so the goal is to keep as continuous a stroke as possible which means that words can often run together um, and you know just a whole host of things that go with the materials and then also materials deteriorate over time we've all had fragile newspapers or something from our family history that may not even be that old but they disintegrate very quickly uh, the human skin produces oil and that oil deteriorates paper very very rapidly uh, which is why you do find in most archives people are required when working with very old documents to wear gloves uh, and to keep their hands, you, your hands dry out very quickly when you're handling old papers or old photographs because those are absorbing that oil from your skin. And then also too, we may be dealing with incomplete materials uh, that can be quite uh, difficult for us to work out what we actually have and we may be literally piecing it together like a puzzle uh, many of us worked on just jigsaw puzzles during the pandemic when we were all trapped at home. But it's very challenging when you don't have that image in front of you to know how the pieces fit together. And so often we're really trying to put together literal fragments of paper to see what we have. All of these things make paleography an even more difficult skill to develop and can create a lot of challenges in our historical research. So some of the things we want to think about when we're trying to undertake the reading of any document is we first need to remember that we're only reading individual letters. Just like the sentence that I read to you, the jumbled up letters, we're not reading whole words. We're trying to read individual letters so that we can make sure that we're getting the most accurate transcription of the document possible. It's from our transcription that we'll do our analysis. It's from the transcription that we can read for comprehension. But when we're creating that transcription, we have to make sure that we're getting each individual letter, just as the writer intended. Uh, and transcribing the document is really a key. Having a cleaner copy, and often, and we'll see this, a copy that we can mark up and we can work on can be extremely valuable. Context. What do we know about the document itself? The more we know about the document, the more we know about its origins, the more we know about its author, the easier it will be for us to understand the contents of the document. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of an exercise that will show why that's important. It's key for us to know common words and phrases. Language changes every day. And if you have children or grandchildren, there are times in which they will speak and their words are almost incomprehensible, and yet they're still in the same language. Uh, and working with college students, there are times when I'm listening to them and I have no idea what they're saying. All of the words are there, but none of it actually makes sense. Well, it's not new, and language has evolved dramatically, uh, and we're going to speak only about the English language. So knowing common words and phrases from previous periods of time can be extremely valuable when trying to understand a document. Uh, grammar, spelling, and punctuation really only become standard uh, in the 18th century and arguably even just the 19th century. So what we know as kind of those rules that we were taught as children are really relatively new. And even people who are very well educated prior to the 19th century uh, would not have found a whole lot of commonality in some of their grammar, spelling, and punctuation um, practices. So we do have to keep that in mind that we, we cannot rely on those rules as we know them when we're reading older documents. It might also be something just as simple as dating. So uh, the Calendar Act of 1752 is what standardized the new year in England. Uh, and at that point, the new year shifted from what was known as Lady Day, the Feast of the Annunciation, which is March 25th, to January 1st. Now they had always celebrated a holiday of New Year's Day on January 1st, but it was not the beginning of the calendar year. And so just knowing some things like that, too, when you read a date, well, okay, what, what act, what's the actual date? We also know that there are calendar shifts within the Catholic and Orthodox world. Uh, so we have things like the Gregorian calendar, the Julian calendar, which can change and alter the types of dates and dating that may influence, again, how we understand a document. Um, one of my areas of interest in, as a student studying Russian history and Russia makes a transition in the latter part of the 19th century, and you have basically what is new style and old style, and often letters will have multiple dates on them, which is thoroughly confusing to us as readers. So we always want to keep those things sorted out. 
And then the other key thing that we've got to think about anytime we're looking at a document is we've got to have a lot of patience. It is a very slow and very tedious process. So that's a little bit of a rundown of why these things are important. Let's just kind of jump into it. So this may be impossible for those at home to see, but hopefully here you can see a little bit of the text. Uh, this is the, the first four lines from a letter. Uh, the letter dates from the 16th of March, 1554, and it was a letter between then Princess Elizabeth to Queen Mary. Now, on the 18th of March was when Mary uh, imprisoned her younger sister in the tower, so the timeliness, knowing the date, is going to be extremely important for helping us ultimately understand the document. So other things that are really interesting to learn is that it is in what we would think of today as italics. Italics was considered a very innovative writing style in the 1550s in England. And Elizabeth would have used this. It would have been very deliberate. She was trying to show her level of sophistication and education, particularly to her older sister, to make sure that her older sister, they of course did not have the best relationship, uh, would have understood that she was coming at this from a position of, of thought and care. Now, some things we want to watch for in, in this particular letter, and we can do this really in any letter that would date from this period, is watch for lots of abbreviations. Keep in mind that even for Princess Elizabeth, paper was expensive. It was a luxury item. It would not have been, as we think about today, something very quick to throw away or recycle. Uh, she would have had um, a very thoughtful use of paper, and she would have been very deliberate. And especially writing a document, a letter that was going to the queen, she would have been even more thoughtful in her handwriting. She wouldn't have wanted to mess it up. It would nice, be a nice, pretty cool Were they copy. actually using paper, paper, or still vellum and parchment by this time? It, we're in a transition period. This is on parchment, actually, this document. The other thing we find is things like U's and V's are very interchangeable, and this has to do more with script than it is with the letter. Uh, and we also, uh, just to, to give you another little thing that's interesting, is possession, where we would have an apostrophe S to show possession. Uh, at this point, it's still very common to have ES. So that, that's something else to kind of watch for in this document. So again, a little hard to read, and this is a, a digital image. Can you pick out any words? Old words. This word's tripping you up? Okay. Well, it's actually one of the things we have to be careful of, and I'll give you some, some tricks here in a second is making sure that what we see is whether it's one letter or two letters or even three letters, because sometimes letters, due to the use of a pen, can look like they're blending together. You can also see at times where they will correct themselves and you'll put things between lines. Because they didn't have erasers. Didn't have an eraser, so yeah. It does mean that any mistakes you do make have to be kind of corrected in the text. You also can't blot everything out because that's gonna bleed through to the other side which means you lose the other side of the paper and you never would have not written on the second side unless you just had you know, very, very little to say. So what are some strategies that we can use to try to understand a document better? Well, the first one is just to rewrite the text. So while you all were working from the screen and those of you at home may have been doing the same thing, one of the first things I would do is write down what you see. Write down, even if you're just writing down individual letters, write down what you see. Because very simply, I can read my own handwriting. Even often when it's just the horrible chicken scratch that becomes my grocery list, I can still read my own handwriting. Now, that doesn't mean that anybody else can read it, but I can read it. So rewriting it in our own hand dramatically increases our comprehension. Look for context clues. It's the same thing as any time we're reading a, a a novel and there's a word that we don't understand, we often will kind of skip over it, keep reading the sentence, and that word becomes clear from the rest of the sentence. We can do the same thing here. If we understand a five-word sentence and we've got four of the five words, then we can maybe make a good educated guess as to what that fifth word might be. 
The other thing we can do is create our own alphabet. And you will see that a lot of tutorials that are teaching paleography will say create a grid of the, of the alphabet and then try to mimic the handwriting from the document you're working on and look for those patterns. How is our author <coughs> forming an A, capital A, lowercase a, a B? You might find that we also, I know I do this in my own handwriting, I don't always form every letter consistently each and every time I write it. So you'll even see some that will have like B1, the way you do a B if it's the start of a letter, a start of a word, or if it's in the middle of a word. Uh, so those are some interesting tricks. We can write out our own alphabet. And then the other strategy that I use is called Wheel of Fortune, which is we know some of the letters, so we create a little grid like Hangman and try to figure out, I know the second letter's an A, I know the fourth letter's a, an R. I can start now to try to piece together what that word might be. So thinking about these four clues, I want you to look at the document again. seem a little easier to read as we kind of think through some of those strategies. We're really trying to look at letters, not at words. Now some things that we see in this document that are really quite fascinating. One is, is the use of abbreviations. So she refers to your M, which of course is your majesty reference to her sister. Um, she has shortened than. Now, there may be a question, and of course we're working with a, a scholar here that far more experienced in these documents than, than I am, but the TH and they have an A, we know that that's than. Now some might say THN. It really kind of doesn't matter either way. More critically, we're, we're getting that context of we also see the omission of a lot of letters uh, within the text. And again, that goes back to that lack of standardization of spelling that we've developed in the 19th and 20th century would not have been the case here. Uh, and in some cases, even Elizabeth, an extremely well-educated woman, was still writing from here. So these first few lines, if any ever did try this old saying that a king's and keeping in mind kings, we have the possessive here as an ES and not an apostrophe S. Word was more than another man's, other, I, I, an, another man's, they, even I messed it up. I most humbly beseech your majesty to verify it in me and to remember your last promise and my last demand that I be not condemned without answer and due process which it seems that now I am for without cause provided. I am by your counsel from you commanded, and then the document goes on. So we see these inconsistent spellings from our, our, our modern language. We see the omission of letters. So that's why it's so important for us. And no punctuation, even no periods. No, oh, absolutely. There's no punctuation at all in this. You know, and you think about it, even just simple things like a, a period would have been really helpful just to kind of let us know where sentences are beginning and ending. Uh, you'll notice no capitalization, or at least no consistent capitalization. Uh, it, there are some periods here, but again, quite inconsistent, and could be nothing more than just the blotches that come with using a stylus or quill. So these types of things we see in all types of documents like this, that we have to really be conscious of picking out letters more so than even trying to pick out words. Now, we'll see some other things too. For instance, you'll see here, last, where that S looks like an F. Um, and so even again, the formation of letters has changed over time. The absence of the E on promise. Um, so these are just some things we always want to look for uh, when we're working through a document. Now, uh, for those here, Let's try this, this a little more on our own. Now, now I'm going to give you a sheet of paper. You're welcome. This, this is not something I'm not going to.
going to be taking it up at the end of class. Uh, but I do want you to look. I also have been kind that we fast forwarded about 200 years. Uh, so we should also find that this is a little bit easier to read. Um, so I want you to think about those same tricks. And we'll go back. Rewriting the text in your own hand. Looking for context clues. Creating your own alphabet. And then that kind of word game, which copyright issues with joke and liation with the game show or Merv Griffin Enterprise. So try to take a moment and just read through this. It's going a little bit easier than the previous document. Yeah. <laughs> I wish all the documents I had to look at from 19th century Lauderdale County were well written as this. Some of us read doctor's handwriting for years. <laughs> yes, then if you can read a doctor's handwriting, you can read me. I would say the same thing from having taught middle school. If you can read a middle schooler's handwriting, you can read anything.
please continue to work on the document. But I'll give you one of the things, so for instance, Lee just pointed out uh, an interesting thing. In reading the document, he put the date as 1700, and the date is actually 1780. It's a little difficult to read. This is a letter from Aristarchus. Now, Aristarchus is a pseudonym. Aristarchus was a French spy, uh, and he would send correspondence to George III uh, throughout his time at the French court, and he wrote directly to George III about various plots uh, for the French that the, the, the French were up to uh, really throughout the mid part of the 18th century. Now, uh, I'll explain a little bit why I use this document. I use this document a lot of times with high school students. Uh, and get them to read it, and of course, if you immediately start talking about, you know, a spy, that gets them excited. It's kind of like a 18th century James Bond. And then when you start reading the document itself, then you get into all kinds of, of plots and other things. But bloodthirsty machination. Absolutely, there's some good language in there that we'll we'll read for the folks at home in just a second. So Aristarchus is a spy. He's corresponding with George the Third. Now there's some things that make this document much much easier to read than the document that we saw on the screen from Princess Elizabeth. First off, we're seeing a, a difference in the quality of the paper, and so the, the paper has just held up better over time. We also see that the words are just spread out better. I mean, it's just better penmanship in some ways than what Elizabeth was using. And then the other thing that's really important for us and helpful for us is that the Aristarchus has only written on one side of the page. So we're not getting any bleed through from the words written on the other side. And he's got some punctuation like apostrophes and periods. Right. We're starting to see the emergence of grammar and spelling and punctuation, though we'll talk in a minute about how capitalization is not quite consistent. So what does our document say? And kind of test yourselves and see how well you did. My last dispatches from Paris happily discover a secret plot and you'll notice the word dispatches, Paris, and plot are all capitalized against your majesty's life. And life is also capitalized. Necker, and that's usually a word that people miss because it's a proper name, having been authentically assured, sir, that you have been seen walking in disguise, disguise again capitalized, probably, at a very late hour in the night, night again capitalized, really certain why, from the upper end of the Queen's Garden quite across into the deputy ranger's lodge, hath pitched upon that place as the most favorable spot for the execution of his horrid and bloodthirsty machination. Aristarchus, November 1st, 1780. Well, when you're teaching this to high school students, and of course if you're teaching them George III, it's always in the context of the American Revolution, they immediately assume that the plots involve Americans trying to assassinate George III, and you have to say, well, no, this is the French. And don't worry, George III still considered the French to be his greatest enemy, not the colonists. But we start to see some really interesting things in this document. As Lee has already mentioned, we're starting to see things like commas, periods, which help dramatically because when we go back to the document from Elizabeth I, the absence of just simple punctuation even just that full stop at the end of a sentence would really make this so much easier to read. Uh, and I'll actually go show this one. Uh, we see here the transcription, and this is a, a verbatim transcription of this document. It would just help for us to know where the ends of sentences are, just something that simple. We also see the use of the apostrophe to determine possessive. So different here than the king's word, we see majesty's life and we have an apostrophe S. So that's gonna help us too, to think about possessives versus plurals. Now one thing that's interesting in this document is there's virtually nothing capitalized. We see the capital M for majesty, but in almost no other place, even in the rest of the document, it's about a 28 line document, um, we see no capitalization. Now in this letter regarding George III, we're just throwing capital letters around like candy. So that also creates some confusion for us. So we want to be mindful of, you know, don't get yourself fixated that a capital letter means the start of a sentence or that a capital letter means a proper noun. Because that would be our normal clue as we go back to even jumbled letters. We would read that and that would immediately be a, a, a point for us to raise. But that's not the case here. 
yeah, they're still doing that in the 1880s in like deeds, wills, it's just like random capitalization of random words. Yeah, at least thankfully when you get to some documents like that, you see a certain standardization yeah. of language. But yeah, the capitalization, grammar, spelling, all of it over the, uh, all over the place. Now one thing that can be really valuable for us is that understanding of context. I didn't tell you anything about this letter when I handed it out. But if I had said, well this is a letter between a French spy and George III talking about a plot, giving you the date, it might have given you at least some understanding of what this document would hold. And it might have helped us if you had certain words that you weren't able to read it might have helped you figure those words out if you had a little bit more information about the document from the start. So, I mean, all of these things are things that we can do to try to read these documents more effectively, um, more efficiently, uh, and hopefully to garner more information from them to help in our research. Now, as I was talking before we started the, the presentation, um, one of the things that I have been doing in my research during the pandemic, things that I've been able to keep going is actually working on a program that has been dealing with the ideas of paleography as a skill set uh, with school children. So just something that's interesting I think for most people is uh, about 10 years ago we decided that it wasn't necessary to teach children cursive handwriting anymore. Uh, in this age of technology where I basically am like most of you glued to my phone uh, I carry my laptop, it seems, every place I go. I'm, I'm always writing on my computer instead of actually writing things out by hand. Those are becoming few and far between. Don't even have a checkbook anymore. Uh, we just put things into our mobile app and it mails money wherever it's supposed to go. I don't know how those things work. Uh, this was an interesting idea. Now, one of the things that came out of this is we started to discover several things. One. Kids can't read cursive handwriting if they don't know how to write in cursive. So if you do want to confuse children today, just write in cursive. They can't understand what you've put down there. It's like a coded message. Uh, and also one thing they've not been able to do is to develop a signature. Because our signature comes out of our practicing of cursive handwriting. Our own distinct cursive handwriting emerges from that and our signature from that as well. Now why is any of this important? Well, in 2015, uh, a team of researchers in the UK started working on a project that became known as the Georgian Papers Program. Uh, I was able to join that project in 2018 uh, with a team of students from UNA. The GPP is, is essentially a 10-year project. It's interdisciplinary in its scope to digitize, conserve, catalog, transcribe, and interpret documents relating to the Georgian period and that's roughly 425,000 pages or 65,000 items that are housed in the Royal Archives and Royal Library at Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle is a private family archive. It is not a governmental archive. And so the Queen's personal family papers are housed there. The materials there are extremely valuable to researchers, <laughs> but they have for the most part really been unaccessible. And the, Center like of Vatican Library. much like the Vatican Library. Well, slightly different in yeah. that the, they're not always as restrictive on who gets in. It's that the building itself is a thousand years old. It's 144 stone steps straight up with no elevator, and their reading room will hold about 10 scholars. So the GPP's goal was to try to get as many of these documents digitized to make them available. Now this has become hugely valuable with the pandemic because these materials were going online and they were going online free of charge. So while it's wonderful to go work at Windsor Castle, don't get me wrong, it's also wonderful to be able to continue to work when the castle was closed during the pandemic as it became uh, HMS bubble to protect the queen and then uh, Prince Philip while he was still alive from the pandemic itself. They couldn't have researchers in the archives. So a group of scholars at King's College London, uh, the Royal Collection Trust, and that actually manages the um, archival materials for the royal family, uh, and several other institutes, including the, the College of William and Mary, got together to work on this project. Now, when I got involved in the project, a lot of what I was asked to do was to think about how these materials could be made accessible to high school students. Um, 
when you have a, a multi-million dollar, multi-million pound project, you've got to find ways to disseminate the information as widely as possible, in large part just to keep the funders happy because you've got to be able to show them that this is being used by more than just a handful of Georgian scholars uh, who just happened to, to not be able to get to Windsor Castle that day. So one of the things we did was we took this project into our local schools. Now, documents just like the, the Aristarchus letter are wonderful, and, and you can see this digitized copy online. But it is difficult when you have 425,000 pages of documents to just scroll through and read every page. We want these to be as easily accessible to scholars as possible. So we want everything to be keyword searchable, which means every document has to be transcribed. Now, 425,000 pages is going to take a long time for one person to transcribe, and frankly, it's going to take a long time for a team of people to transcribe. Part of what I argued was that the transcription work could really be done by anybody who was given the skills of a paleographer, and that did not require a degree in history or a degree in literature or a degree in archival studies. It really just meant you needed to be able to read English. And so we started working with high school kids and college kids at UNA. So uh, we created a course. We actually embedded this uh, exercise, the skills development, as well as the projects into two credit-bearing courses at UNA. We've also had students from Heritage Christian University here in Florence working on it. We did a study abroad trip to London in the summer of 2019 where 12 students from UNA were able to go to the UK and actually work in the Royal Archives. They were the very first international college group to ever be credentialed to work in the Royal Archives. And I made it very clear to those students that went with me, this is extremely special. Like, this does not happen to everybody. But what was so fun was the students were getting first-hand information on how to translate, how to transcribe, uh, and, and how to document this type of information. We have an entire computer system that they key it into so that the text looks like the transcription that I, I passed out to you. This is what would come up on your screen in connection with this document. So researchers get both, the original and the transcribed copy. So then the question came if we were successful. We had college students working on this. Who else could do it? So um, just as a side note, I was sitting in a meeting uh, in London with the team, and it was one of the first meetings I ever attended in person, and they were just going through some statistics and everything. And they said, well, we, we've now gotten up to 52 uh, transcribers working around the world, and somebody said, well, can you do like a breakdown of where everybody is? And they said, oh yeah, no, we can do that. We've got 15 working here in the UK, and then we have another 10 working at the College of William and Mary, and the rest are in Alabama. And I have to say, I kind of laughed a little bit. I thought, here we are, we had basically a, half the team uh, was working in Alabama on this project. So not just were our students doing some really interesting work, they were really carrying the lion's share, no UNA pun intended, in making this project actually happen. But then we said, if college kids can do it, who else? So we decided to pitch this to two groups. One was to work with partner teachers, and I had a few teachers who were in the class, and they said, can I do this with my students? I said, go ahead, give it a try. Let's see how they do. So since 2019, we have actually worked with over 2,500 school children in North Alabama and Southern Tennessee on this paleographic work, on these paleographic skills, and this transcription project. Um, I have a wonderful team of girls from E.O. Kaufman Middle School in Lawrenceburg uh, who actually took a 50-page document of household records and they transcribed it in the afternoons after school as a special project with their history teacher. They had so much fun. They did a presentation for their parents. They ended up doing a presentation for the school. We were able to bring them to UNA to meet with some of the students from our project who'd been working on this. And even better, we were able to get some video uh, with them to get a sense of what their experience was. We worked at Russellville High School. Now you may be aware that Russellville has a large uh, ESL student population. So 
Students who, for whom English is not their first language, you might say, oh, would this work be really difficult? Turns out it's not, because one of the challenges you were facing in this transcription was you were still trying to understand what you were reading, not just writing down the letters. Well, those ESL students are able to shift off their kind of language comprehension skills and just get the document transcribed. So I had two young girls that have just recently come to the United States, and they got through this letter that you all just did. They did it in about four minutes. I mean, they just flew through writing down, and then they, I, I said, guys, it's not a race, it's okay. And then they went back and read it, and of course were able to read it and understand it. But for them, it was just the transcription that they needed to do, which is that first real step as paleographers. Uh, and so, you know, between working with different school groups, and this has been some of our more affluent schools working with advanced placement students and students who are in uh, early college programs getting college credit as well as some students who might be kind of written off by their schools as the students who are not as academically inclined. As soon as you bring up something like we've got a plot and a spy, all of a sudden this becomes far more interesting in exercise than just copying down some old words on a piece of paper. So we use some of those techniques to excite the high school students with what we're doing. Ultimately, uh, it's been amazing what the students have learned. And you'll see just a few pictures from classes. This is our study abroad group that went to London. Um, the kids really actually get into it. They find it quite fun. Now, it has been helpful that schools have realized that this not teaching cursive has proven to be problematic. But actually, Russellville City Schools, when we were down there starting this program with them, that was the very first high school that I visited. I uh, partnered with Kim Burney, who is one of their exceptional teachers. Uh, we were able to actually bring their superintendent, principal, and their director of curriculum in to see what the kids were doing because they were in the process of developing a new cursive curriculum for high school students. So they realized the mistake had been made, and I was like, well, here's the thing. It doesn't need to just be taught for the English class or for students to be able to, to read cursive. It's also an extremely important historical skill they've got to have. I said, we can open up so many more primary sources to them if they can sit down and read it. Now, the problem I did create for their teacher was I said, and your history teachers can be involved in teaching cursive too. So, of course, gave their history teachers one more thing to try to do and teach. We do a little bit of this in our, in our basic genealogy program because amateur genealogists, if you're researching your family's history, you'll have to translate deeds from 1780 or 1858, and it's a lot of the same issues of translation and context. So Absolutely. you can sort of get a working knowledge mm -hmm. of paleography and transcription just by virtue of being an amateur armchair genealogist and looking at a hundred deeds, you know, that your ancestors. Sure, uh, and, and the these same skills are really helpful when you're going through a large body of, of material like that because you'll start to see, especially if you're reading something that's been written by the same author, you'll see those patterns of language, you'll see letter formation, uh, and you can start to create little cheat sheets and you can find ways to just speed that work up, especially if you're just looking for key pieces of information and not needing to transcribe an entire document. I'm just looking for a key name. I'm looking for certain birth dates or a certain plot of land. Having those skills are actually really important because it allows you to pick out the information that's most valuable to you. You don't need to transcribe the whole document. You need to transcribe yeah. those key pieces. My favorite is where census enumerators say in 1850 will abbreviate the word ditto. Instead of making the little dash marks, they'll abbreviate the word ditto, D-O, mm -hmm. which is more work than just making two little, but that's the way they do it. People, but also, what is do? What is do? <laughs> What's an abbreviation for ditto, same as above? Well, and that's one of those things, too, as we think about looking for those patterns in language, patterns in abbreviation. None of that is, is standardized, really, and, and we could even say pushing that uh, even more so into the 20th century where we've seen global communication become the norm, where we do have to have far more um, of a regimented form of communication. So you do, but those are where those great little tricks come in of trying to figure out what your particular author was doing and why they did it. Um, and that's where this work has been really interesting, particularly when we have the students working on like household documents. So uh, again, it's a personal family archive, but it also contains all of the materials from the royal kitchens and 
uh, purchasing items. So there are these ledgers of items that were being purchased. Well, you have to start figuring out, well, who was doing the purchasing and who was doing the recording? Because things that were coming out of the kitchens are being recorded differently than things that were coming out of like, you know, a lady's maid or a, a personal attendant to a member of the royal family or even the documents from the royal, royal family themselves. Um, one of the, the phenomenal documents that the students who went on the trip were able to see and that we've used an awful lot in classes teaching the American Revolution is the first time that George III actually writes that Britain is going to lose the American colonies at the end of the Revolutionary War. And he writes this in what are known as the Georgian Essays, and George III wrote prolifically. He would sit down every night. He was a, an insomniac, and he couldn't, uh, he could never sleep. And you can even see from this letter, they figured out that he's walking all over his estates by himself, basically dressed as a gardener. Um, and they figured out who he is and where he's going. Well, at night he would sit down and write out everything that had happened in the course of his day. And I always kind of explain to students, it's not a diary in a sense that he's writing down his feelings. It's really almost like taking class notes. But in doing so, you think about how we write for different audiences. He's writing this for himself. The, the document is, is, has tons of abbreviations in it and little comments and asides, and he has names and, and abbreviations for people. So you've got to sit down and figure out exactly who he's writing for to figure out you know, what this information is. Very different than if you were going to sit down and write a letter to someone, uh, maybe even better write a letter to a stranger, you would never use those kind of personal anecdotes or abbreviations if you don't share already a common language. And so we have figured out too that sometimes a clerk in the courthouse, like if he's recording a marriage, but he's got the will book already out rather than get this big heavy marriage book and record it. He'll record the marriage in the will book because he's got it open mm -hmm. or vice versa. So there are a handful of Lauderdale County marriages from the 19th century that are recorded in deed books because the clerk was too lazy to get the appropriate book. And so if you're looking for them in the marriage book, which only makes common, they're not gonna be there. Yeah. Well, and we kind of see the same thing when you're working through you know, early modern documents and even into the modern period. Uh, things become somewhat amalgamated because, again, paper was quite <clears throat> scarce. The recording information, the ability to organize and file things away, of course, is radically different. Um, we think today, you know, we can, we can print out six copies of an email and put it in six different places. And there were no copies of, of almost everything that was being done unless it was an extremely important document that would have been copied and kept for official records yeah. purposes. So you do often have to look in extraordinary places to find ordinary things because there was not as, as regimented a filing system. And, and with vellum, you can't just throw it away, so you scrape off the writing and smooth it over and use it again. Mm -hmm. So well, uh, sometimes I think what's underneath a document is even more important than the actual document you're looking at sure. in some extraordinary cases. Well, it's also fun when you take these to school kids and you'll see that like on a letter they will write the body of the letter, and then they write around the yeah. edge of the letter Every because you fill the margins, yeah. and then you flip it over and you do the same thing. And of course, by the time the ink has bled through the paper, it's almost a completely uh, illegible document, but you can start then to pick out individual words. Okay, well, I can piece these words together, and then I can start to see how this connects, and then I can kind of figure out from the date who they might be writing to, or how signatures, nicknames, we think about family nicknames that we may even still use today, or how we sign documents to each other. Uh, the use of abbreviations, I use abbreviations in emails all the time. Uh, or how I take personal notes and what those look like. I always think, even when I go back and look at things I wrote years ago, I have no idea that even what I wrote, uh, and it's my own handwriting and something that I did myself, so again, thinking about how we can extract that information from somebody who may have lived hundreds of years ago. It all becomes quite a big fun puzzle. And so just, uh, we're getting close on time and I do want to make sure people have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, you know, it is a, it's a fascinating skill. Uh, and it's one that um, often we don't teach, particularly to undergraduate history students. It's much more of a skill developed for, in graduate school. Uh, but one thing we've been able to experiment with through this project is that actually it's a skill set that can be developed with extremely young children. I mean, some of the, my very best paleographers in North Alabama are eighth graders in Southern Tennessee and, and down in Russellville 
and places that you wouldn't exactly expect to find a whole bunch of budding historians. Uh, but actually, they're developing the skills that, that many of us as professional historians had to develop in grad school. Um, and so it's opening for them a lot of materials that would not have been open. And especially as we think about the proliferation of, of materials online related to genealogy, uh, or just the, the number of databases that are out there with historical documents. This gives them another opportunity to glimpse those in their original format and to see so many other things that come with those original documents. To understand the marginalia, the little comments, the types of paper, the seals, the artistry of many of these documents is really quite fun. Instead of for them just always seeing a boring typed text. Like Brother Cedric in 1100, it's dark and my hands are cramped as I write this. Yeah. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions? I'm wondering, uh, what are you going to do with uh, graduate students who can't do cursive writing? I have a feeling we're going to be teaching them to write a cursive. Um, it's going to be interesting. So that kind of educational shift we're seeing the the first group that wasn't taught cursive in elementary school is now roughly a senior freshman, sophomore in college, senior okay. high school. When did they quit requiring that? I can't it remember. was about 10 years ago. So we have, and now for many places it's coming back. Like I said, Russellville City Schools is bringing it back. Um, and we're seeing it kind of emerge back in conversations about English language arts with, with elementary school kids. A lot of teachers, there's some that didn't stop teaching it. I mean, it was, I would say, a, not a uniform practice to stop teaching cursive. It was just pretty widespread. So we're seeing that first group come to college. I will tell you, watching them take notes by printing is exhausting. I'm like, guys, you can do this so much more easily if you're writing cursive, and they do not know how to do that. Um, we saw it, one of the first ways that it was really identified as a problem was kids could not sign their selective service form, which you are required by law to do at 18, opening a bank account. You have to go yeah. to the bank and still sign. I heard about kids not being able to sign like their paychecks or yeah. even a personal check, and they didn't even realize that their printed signature is not the same thing. Right. Well, and even in Alabama, we have our signature on our driver's license. So, you know, if you can't do that at 16 or 15 when you go to get a learner's permit, yeah. um, and we're finding a lot of that, that, that was where these things started to be highlighted. We're like, well, why can't these kids sign their name on a driver's license? You know, why can't they fill out a form? Why can't they sign for athletics? In many cases, you have to prove age through the presentation of a birth certificate, uh, but also it often requires a form for a student to sign as well, parent uh, signature, these types of things. Filling out a college application, there's still a portion that has to be signed uh, because you're surrendering information. You have to be able to prove who you are. So it's come back. A lot of schools are teaching it now. I do think we're gonna have to figure out how we fill in that gap. Um, and some high schools are doing it. Uh, I think what's gonna happen with his, uh, history programs, again, we don't typically teach paleography as an undergraduate course. But when they hit graduate school, which is only really gonna be, you know, at most three or four years away, um, paleography classes are gonna start, I think, by being courses in cursive handwriting. Getting out that old, you know, three-line sheet and learning how to form the letters. Those big fat pencils you used to have as kids. <laughs> yeah, well, it did make me realize, I, I was actually talking to, um, I was in one school and uh, they had some visitors and the, the visitors were brought by the classroom where I was teaching with the uh, their permit teacher. And they were asking me what I was doing and I said, well, we're teaching paleography and we're, we're showing kids, you know, these 18th, uh, 17th and 18th century documents. And, uh, the lady told the story, she said, I had left a note for my grandchild with some money attached to it. It was a shopping list. And she said, uh, I came home and the shopping list was still, still sitting there but the money was gone. And, uh, and she said, well, where's, where's my money and where are the groceries? Like, oh, I took the money and went to you know, give, get fast food or something like that uh, because I was hungry. And said, well, why didn't you read the shopping list and go to the grocery store and get these groceries? And she said, oh, I couldn't read it. And her, her granddaughter could not read a shopping list. 
because it had been written in cursive. And so she sat there and she was dumbfounded. And of course she said, too, I've lost my money. Um, <laughs> she said, at least my granddaughter was fed. She said, but... And at least I had set up to say, well, yeah, I went to McDonald's and stayed right. the store. Uh, but to, to have her granddaughter have to admit that is a well-educated and, and clearly a very sweet young lady uh, did not know how to read her grandmother's handwriting. And so you think of how many things are lost to us if we can't read them. You know, cards and, and letters. We're not that far removed from that communication. Yeah, well, I mean, say your hard drive goes down or your cell phone is on the fritz, what are you going to do? You know, you might have to resort to. I keep, I keep saying one giant electromagnetic pulse that takes out all the server, which my brother and other IT people say the odds of that happening can never happen. I'm like, as an argument, if we no longer had computers, a lot of us would be just up a creek. Well, we have a lot of students that would just sit there and stare at each other until someone came and told them what to do. Um, <laughs> a lot of grown-ups would, too. But having been uh, a public school teacher and, and, of course, working at UNA, it's inevitable that you go in and at some point the computer doesn't work. It doesn't turn on or the projector doesn't turn on, and you have to go back to writing on the board. Uh, and so, again, I had to think the other day while teaching a, a, a class, I couldn't write in cursive on the board because I wasn't certain that my students were going to be able to read it. <coughs> so I had to print on the board, which is not that difficult to do, but it, it was something to think about, was that I may be writing in a form that is just not clear to them as first year students at a university because these are skills that we just have not been teaching. You know, something that occurred to me when I was reading is I took uh, <clears throat> shorthand in high school mm -hmm. uh, to be able to take notes when I got to college. And a lot of these words uh, had letters that you would have used in shorthand for that. I can imagine, yes. Well, and again, that's something that, that shifted very much. There's the idea of kind of traditional secretarial work shorthand and typing from dictation things like that have gone away most people just sit down at a computer and type their own letters and information they can copy and paste things it, it definitely has changed how we communicate but yeah shorthand is a big part of this it's about abbreviations and, and symbols to, to quickly get through information and a lot Same of those thing. came up during the, the digital age like BFF that wasn't even a thing 30 years ago uh, the joys of text speak. yes OMG BFF <laughs> RFIL or R was it rolling on floor laughing? I can't even remember what all the letters are. So if you went back far enough in, in the uh, English archives, you'd be reading French, I guess, wouldn't you? And and then you'd have a transition in, into a more modern English? Yeah, um, it kind of depends on what you're reading, uh, but you do find a fair bit, you know, if you get back far enough, it's Norman French, um, obviously Latin uh, for a lot of governmental documents. You also find a number of documents that will be a mix. Now, English as a vernacular language for written communication, you definitely see emerging in the, middle, in the medieval period, and you would see that in correspondence. Um, you would also see a fair bit of French, too. Again, it kind of depends on who you're talking to. Using the Elizabeth document's a good example. You know, the fact that she's using italics, which would have been relatively new, uh, a, a relatively new form of penmanship, uh, was a way of her conveying kind of her sophistication and, and modernity. So it'd be kind of the same thing. If I'm, if I'm writing a communication to, you know, maybe somebody on my estate, I might use English. But if I'm writing to the, you know, to the king or to the court, I may choose to use Latin or French in order to, to differentiate my audience. Um, you do find that, at least in England, you know, you've got, because you have, obviously with the Norman invasion, you have that use of the French, Norman French language in a lot of correspondence and a lot of government documents. You, you really can, can use language there to determine a lot about the origins of the document, the author of the document, um, the, you know, even down to sometimes geographic information that can come from that based on certain word usage and, and things. So, that's where, as a paleographer, it's not just as simple as just copying down the letters. It's also helping us to date documents, uh, to prove authenticity, um, to, to prove you know ownership and authorship can be really key. And sometimes they also use dating by 
the reign of kings. Sure. Or yeah, you even often see that days, church days. Yeah, because again, calendars yeah. are not quite as formalized as they are today, and uh, so yeah, often you'll see references to the reign. Third of year of the reign of King Stephen. Third year of the reign of King Richard II, or whatever. Right. So you've kind of been easy on us with these documents, haven't you? <laughs> using actual English words. And... Right. Um, he could well, have given us Latin or. But see, that's phrase. where it gets really fun too, is because sometimes in and, and using the Georgian Papers program as an example, um, you know, the Hanoverians were Germans. And George I did not speak English and did not write in English, so all of his materials are essentially in German. Um, but there was correspondence in French and German, uh, and so sometimes you'll come across in the midst of a stack of documents something that is in another language. It, it, it was fun because they all still had to be transcribed, and so several of our students who uh, had also studied French worked on a collection of French documents. Uh, and that was really neat too to see is how how our language skills how key it is for us to learn foreign languages. But yeah, you, you never quite know. Um, and and you know, finding different types of things is also really fun. Again, because you know today we have far more sophisticated archival systems and, and records management systems. We keep often like with like, and we we can coordinate and, and collate materials so differently. Um, in many cases, you'll see, you know, everything from personal correspondence to governmental commentary or, or governmental documents to poetry, um, all kind of in the same folio because it all has maybe the same author. But again, paper and, and communication was so different that often those things kind of get lumped into one big thing. Be a really oh. Interesting thing to see the person who can program a computer to do it. There is software now that can do it. Uh, and we've worked with, through this program, we've worked with a couple of different um, software companies. It's still not the level of accuracy that you need. I can tell you that from using Ancestry.com, their character recognition software often leaves much to be desired which is where it's good to have a live person that knows that uh, Fran is not a name, but John is a name. Because <laughs> the computer thinks it just, they, they, I know they're doing the best they can, but it's not quite there yet. Yeah, and I do think that type of you know, AI technology is only gonna improve over time. But um, you know, the uniqueness of individual handwriting is fascinating. Uh, and even thinking about our own handwriting of how, you know, those of us in this room, if we all sit down and wrote the same sentence, we'd be able to pick out whose handwriting it is because we all have a unique penmanship. Um, so but the same thing, the, the technology just hasn't quite caught up, but it is pretty good. It's impressive yeah. what it can do. It is, it is. I complain about it, but it's way better than having to do everything by hand. Sure, and if you've got, especially one of the things that's fascinating, we work with one company that the software learns from patterns. So it does a much better job when you give it like a thousand pages from the same author. Because it will then start to pick out, as soon as you correct, well that's a D. Well it's never gonna miss that D again. It's when you're doing one-offs from 15 different authors is where it's not nearly as effective. But the flip side of that is we aren't either. One of the things we tell students is when you're working with a collection, try to like the like. If you've got, if you're working with an author, try to do everything by that author at one time because your brain will read it so much more easily. You'll see those patterns much more clearly than if you're going from one document to another document to a third document. So in some ways, these exercises when we're doing them with school kids in a classroom are not 100% fair because they're often just working with one piece or two pieces. Um, but if you had them sitting down and doing sustained work on, on one author, you know, especially if it was one, not just one author, but one type of material, say all personal letters, it'd be amazing how quickly they could learn those skills and get through a large chunk of information. All right. Leah, I know we're uh, gone over. Uh, just a few minutes, that's fine. Um, this was a great way to kick off Renaissance Month. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bibby, for a really cool <laughs> exercise, which 
I was familiar with a little bit of these because I do have to read and translate 19th century documents as a, as a genealogist and local historian. But I mean, we went back to Tudor times and so that's a whole nother different set of challenges. Mm -hmm. And I've read a little bit about like New Testament ancient translations. One lady at our church 20 years ago kind of got uh, exasperated because someone was talking about ancient Greek and translation and she's like, well, I've got a Bible in English. Why do I need to care what the ancient Greek says? <laughs> and we were trying to get her to understand that they have to translate the Bible, the New Testament in particular, from ancient Greek into English, and it's not quite as straightforward as it might always seem. So I will say a few words in summing up. Uh, thank you for being here. Hopefully the live stream went well. I have to give a shout out to my brother, Lord William, uh, Harold and Stewart, to Her Majesty Queen Serene for being our IT guy today and making sure the live stream went as planned. And then uh, remember next week uh, at 2 p.m. at the Florence Lauderdale Public Library Coliseum, Dr. Brenna Wardell of UNA will be giving, a, from the English department, will be giving a program entitled Bewitched by Rich Display, Renaissance Clothing in the Court, the Street, and the Theater. And if you've seen her <coughs> on our library Facebook page doing her movie discussions, you know that's gonna be really good. And then the third Thursday, uh, excuse me, the third Sunday, Sunday, October 17th at 2 p.m. Uh, at the library in the Colonnade, Dr. Carl Franks from UNA's uh, English department, who is also a board member of the Alabama Renaissance Fair, will be doing a program titled Witches and Familiars in Western Europe, 906 <coughs> to 1599 AD. And this one really intrigues me. So I'm, these will all be very good. Of course, the Renaissance Fair will happen this year, Saturday and Sunday, October 23rd and 24th at Fountain on the Green, AKA Wilson Park. Uh, we canceled our feast this year because it was an indoor event and due to COVID and having to restructure it so dramatically, we thought it's that's more trouble than it's worth. Let's not even do it this year. But the fair will go on, so join us that weekend and remember next week. Um, and, uh, Thanks for being here. If anybody doesn't, if there's, if I remember to say everything, if I didn't, Mark and William. All right. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.